Good morning, guys. How's everybody doing? Sweet. Some of you are smiling. Most of you are clinically alive. It's a good start. Um, I'm Juho. And um, like my friends at IDEAN, I've been around for um, the past 20 years, which is to say I started my design career exactly 20 years ago. Like Elisa explained, um, during day I'm a design lead at Posti, and during night time I have a dirty sinful side gig as a design leadership mentor. So um, today I thought, um, since we have actually competent people speaking about future, I'm going to focus on being the stand-up act in the beginning, just rambling about myself incoherently for half an hour. I would ask if that's cool with you, but it's more for a rhetorical question, because you're my hostage for the, past, for the next uh, 30 minutes, so enjoy the circus, guys. Um, I reviewed my career from the last 20 years while I was preparing for uh, this train wreck, and I realized that even though I've been working on a shit ton of uh, different kinds of industries and projects and perspectives, there's actually two things uh, that are constant in my life. One is my love for lounge music, and I have a really, 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 really kick-ass playlist that you should all be subscribing right now on your mobiles. Um, and the other is my love for bright colors. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm actually going to wrap my history in design, or at least the relevant parts, um, in the music I was listening while I was working in this industry, and um, the colors that Pantone chose as colors of the year for those specific years. So uh, let's get this shit show moving. So we're going to start with um, 1999, uh, 2000, the turn of the millennia. And um, <clears throat> this was a time when Pantone started the color of the year with cerulean blue. That's 15, 40, 20 for the other color nerds out there. Um, I was really into deep clubhouse music. Um, Game Boy Color and the Pokemon was still a thing, and Eric Cartman taught us that it's cool to go home. Um, I was living in a really, really small town, and when I say small town, I mean, honest to God, um, God-fearing, moonshine-drinking, cow-tipping cousin-marrying um, Hicksville in the middle of, middle of Finland, which has way more cows than people living in it even today. And when you think about these small towns, um, they're kind of similar around the world, right? Like, you have small towns in um, Hicksville, USA, and in... in um, different places in Europe, and one thing that's common is that when you're living there as a teenager, you really only have two things you can do. Uh, well, four if you count the cousin marrying and the cow tipping. Um, but you can either get drunk behind the neighborhood power transformation box every Friday, or you can find a way of escapism. And um, My particular brands of what cover were um, the internet, because that was a cool thing back then, and video games. So I kind of started playing around with web design. Um, this was all like super experimental back then. People didn't really have any rules, uh, which is super awesome, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, so I was playing around with things like e-zines. Those are a thing. I don't, I don't think any of you actually remember that word, but those were a thing back then. So you basically took um, a tabloid and turned it into a website and called it a webzine or e-zine, and that was really, really cool. Um, I had a couple, um, and I was working on, on a few websites for friends of mine, and, and actually did, a, did some commissioned work, uh, which actually landed me a job offer. Um, this was in August 1999, um, and I got a call uh, from a new media agency, which is a fancy word for a digital ad agency, um, asking if I'm interested in joining them as a web designer. So, um, I was... 16, just about to turn 17 then, and I walked um, with, with, with the confidence of a Greek god. I walked to my high school principal and went like, screw you, education's for suckers, man! <laughs> and I uh, packed my shit and moved to Helsinki to work in an ad agency. Um, <clears throat> I kind of regret saying that now, but it's, it, it was really satisfying back then. You can relate if, if you didn't like being in high school. Um, this was actually one of the w first projects I ever worked on as a professional designer. I managed to find it through the Internet Archive. So, it's an airport for geese, because obviously it's an airport for geese. It was, this was 99 and we smoked a lot of weed. <laughs> um, this was actually a project that we worked on for Sonera, which is nowadays called Telia. So, it's a huge teleoperator here in Finland. Um, we were kind of working on things that intersected between uh, youth marketing and, and kind of new age, new media type of deals. 
being really experimental with the things that, that we were working on. This was a time when people spent like hundreds of thousands of euros just trying something new, and it's actually really exciting. It's a shame that I couldn't find a version of this site that actually wouldn't have had broken links, but I guess it's kind of a big, it's a good depiction of a time uh, when getting online sounded like two uh, robots having very angry sex. I have a picture. <laughs> the point that I'm making um, is that it was really, really cool to be in an, in an era when, where everything is experimental. Like, there were no rules whatsoever. Like, there were no limits to the work that we were doing. So if you want to take, uh, I don't know, let's say Taco Bell, Anus Destruction, Brown, and shoot it down there with some low-grade 3D and trans, um, transparency grid from PowerPoint, power to you. It's really cool. This used to be a really cool website. Um, all the companies were also doing experimentations with web design. Hoover had a website, um, I think this was in 2000. Like, they had a website which had a flash animation that was so on fleek that you can still find this on Vimeo. Now, the problem is that back in 2000, uh, people were trying to open this with a 56K modem, and it, it was actually like 12 and a half megabytes or something, so no one ever actually saw anything beyond this picture. <laughs> but if you go to Vimeo now and, and search for Hoover website, you can actually still find this animation, and it's pretty cool. So this is actually the first lesson um, I'm going to give you from my, my past 20 years. Um, you can actually find inspiration anywhere still today. We're just really kind of cooped up in, in the notion of what design is. And we kind of forget to look outside the typical sources of inspiration. So you make the rules, you beautiful bastard. Break them. So if, if you make the rules, you can break them just as easily. So try to find inspiration from anywhere. Do, do things that are experimental. You don't have to care about what people think is, is cool design these days. So then we get to 2005, 2006, Pantone chose blue turquoise as, as a color of the year. And while I think it's awful as a color, it has a really nice sounding name. Um, I was really into listening to uh, Lemon Jelly. Lost Horizons is a really good album. You should really check it out. <laughs> Sweet. Um, we also got YouTube, which um, showed us that it's really funny seeing people getting hit in the nutsack, nutsacks with various things. Um, also cat videos, and um, us designery types got our first MacBook Bros. Um, this is also an interesting time in my career because I think it's the first time um, I made an actually major pivot in my career. So up until then, I had been working on the web and um, dabbling with things like um, what would um, the web and applications look like on handheld devices. Um, but I hadn't actually professionally worked on UIs before. Um, we used to call it human-computer interaction back then. There wasn't really a term UX, at least in Finland, um, before 2006, 2007. Um, I, I, I got into handhelds and, and Nokia devices accidentally, because I was actually working um, on web when uh, two guys from Nokia, uh, two suits as I like to call them, um, came to our office and asked if there's anyone uh, in our team who's worked on devices before. I hadn't, but I thought it sounded fun, so I was like, right here. <laughs> Consummate professional. So uh, they actually hired me as a consultant to work on, on this device right here, which is the Nokia 770 internet tablet. And it's actually uh, still a pretty cool device. So if you think, think about this for a moment, so we wanted to create an actual tablet device in 2005, and we managed to do that. I mean, the, the device itself was crap, but it's, it's, it's a really interesting concept back in the day, and, and it, it, it still has a lot of merit. Uh, this was also a time that interestingly introduced the idea of designer specialization. Like, when you were a designer, you weren't just a designer, you were a visual designer, an interaction designer, you were potentially a researcher, uh, you might have been a UI writer, prototyper, or you were a design manager. And people kind of tended to put you in one of these silos. So there was a defined bucket, and then somebody <laughs> dropped you in it. Um, I happened to be um, an interaction designer, so that kind of pushed me in a direction where people expected me to work on flows and UIs without getting too deep into research or prototyping or visual design. And I think it's kind of funny 
Um, back then, we considered uh, T-shaped designers being like good designers. So anyone who had experience or skills uh, from multiple fields kind of became a T-shaped designer. That was kind of something to shoot for. Um, but I also think that there were M-shaped designers, so people who kind of had what we nowadays call full stack, which is a term I hate, but we, we still do that. So we had people who had deep expertise with multiple fields, but they were still expected to live within a certain role or within a certain sandbox. So um, I'm going to leave you with that thought for a moment. I'm going get to get back to the when I actually get to the future of things. So remember this picture. So then we get into um, a period in my career which I think is actually most significant. So 2008-2010 is, is when I um, actually joined Nokia as an internal designer and I was thrown, I was thrown into a team um, that was uh, called Services and Software Creative Direction, but there was essentially only me working in it, so it was kind of a, kind of a weird, weird team name. Um, other stuff that happened with, which are, are significant in this period in time is that Pantone chose Blue Iris as the color of the year. I was really into thievery cooperation. You also need to check that out. It's, it's really cool. Um, Kanye West gave us one more reason to punch him in the mouth and um, we got Barack Obama, which is super awesome, my man. Um, this was, hilariously, it was also the year when I met my wife who's cringing at me in the front row. Welcome, honey. Um, but the most interesting thing that happened was that I was working on something called Ovi. How many of you actually remember this? Oh, actually quite a few people, that's cool. Um, there is a deeper story behind Ovi than just the service that kind of came out and sucked ass. We, we, were, we were actually doing something pretty interesting. So this was 2007, 2008, and we were essentially trying to create a combination of um, Google Cloud, um, Spotify, uh, Netflix, um, and Google Maps and a few other apps into like one cloud, master cloud application that lives in your phone. It's hard to see how that failed in 2008. Um, but it was, it was cool because it was super, super ambitious. And um, I think the, the really interesting thing for me personally was that we were, we were working on it with IDEO. We also worked with Frog Design and AKQA. Um, so I had a lot of really influential, powerful, brilliant designers to work with and learn from. So um, I personally think that from the X million of euros we pumped to IDEO to work on the OVI concept, I'm probably the one who actually benefited the most. Um, they, luckily for me, they actually spent quite a lot of time uh, training me and sparring with me and teaching me some of the mindsets and some of the tools that I still carry today. And this, I think, is the point in time when I finally started to understand that design is actually something bigger than a practice or a discipline or a specific toolbox or a process. Design started to be a mindset to me. Um, I, was working with, I was working with people like Peter Gilman, Tim Brown, uh, Will Getter, um, all these brilliant design leaders, and they didn't actually consider design to be a practice that's very tightly locked in a specific kind of a cage. So I learned that it's, it's important, at least for me personally, to think of design as a mindset that you can apply on things. This was also the time when I learned that uh, no matter how much I personally idolized people like Peter and, and Tim, uh, these are all people who are just as insecure as you are. And they have their own things they need to learn. And they have their own things they still haven't mastered. So, it was nice to see that um, I was kind of already at, on, on the right track thinking that we're, we all have things that we want to learn and we all have things that we want to teach and that's, that's a permanent state for a designer. Like when you start thinking that you're ready, you're probably failing or you need to retire, either or. So there, then we're getting to uh, 2011, uh, Pantone chose Honeysuckle um, as as the color of the year. It's a really dirty word, but it's a really beautiful color. So it's, it's one, of my, one of my favorites. Um, I got into Brian Eno. Um, there's a really great album from Brian Eno and Rick Holland called The Panic of Looking. 
um, which is from 2011. We also got our first modern day, um, modern day royal wedding, and way more interestingly for the video game types out there, we got Skyrim. Fuck yes, great game. Um, how many of you know Happa Hotel? Sweet, even more than Ovi. That's cool. Um, so. In 2011, I was actually hired as the creative director of UX for Hapo. So it's, um, for those who, like three people who don't know what Hapo is, it's, it's basically a virtual world for teenagers. And um, I was super excited to work on it for several reasons. I think the biggest one is that um, this was the first time I was actually uh, working in the games industry. Um, I didn't end up enjoying that part of it. Um, I'm not going to go into details, but it's kind of like when you go to a game industry, people are expecting you to be there for life and live and breathe games. And um, I think there has to be more in life than just playing games. Um, but the point is, it was really interesting to work on a virtual world as a UX designer, because there's like multiple aspects to it, one of which is the um, overall psychology of what you're creating. So you're creating a world that sits on top of the actual, like physical world. And you have all the people there doing really weird, um, obscure things. So uh, the typical user group, I don't know if this still, still holds true today, but they told true like eight years ago. Um, the typical user is uh, someone in their, their early teens. So people, in, in people who are 12 or 13 or 14. And um, they go to Habbo not only to talk to their friends, but to work, which is really, really odd. So they actually have like proper um, jobs that they create. So somebody's owning a cafeteria and um, they employ people who come there every day at a certain time, stand behind a virtual counter, wait for people to stand next to them and say that they want a coffee. And then they give them a coffee and they go sit somewhere and drink the coffee while the person who's working there is serving another person coffee. And I thought that was super weird, but it was also super interesting. So like purely from the psychological point, it was really fun just walking around, um, taking a look at what all these kids were doing. Um, and it was interestingly also one of the best experiences I have had in my career for gathering feedback uh, for several reasons. First of all, you could just actually walk into the world and ask someone if they like a feature or not. And if they didn't, you could actually push for changes by making the changes, pushing them into the world, changing them on the spot and asking them, do you like it now? Which is actually really awesome. That's, that's the kind of interaction and dialogue I haven't really experienced in any other um, points of time in my career. Um, but this is also interesting because they create fan sites for Habbo. I took this screenshot from an active Habbo fan site forum two nights ago. So they still have, like even after, I don't know how many, 15 years or something, they still have like actual loyal fans who, who um, are building who are building the service. And one of the great practices I learned that I'm still dragging with me is the dialogue, open dialogue in social media about the features that you're creating. So um, we spend a lot of time actually discussing the things that we're generating uh, both within the world itself and within Twitter. So I was live tweeting things that I'm generating on my, on my Photoshop and people were commenting on it. And, we got a real dialogue going. I could thro throw wireframes in there. I could throw some UI mock-ups or just go into an argument of why I think it's weird that they have jobs as teenagers in, in virtual cafeterias. <laughs> um, but this, this actually brings me to an interesting lesson. When you open up your entire design process uh, in social media, um, well, you obviously expose yourself to people uh, saying that your design is bad and you should feel bad, because that happens. That's, that's the very first thing that happens. But when you shovel through the sheet, um, you actually get into a mode where you're brutally open and honest about the things that you're generating, the pros and the cons. And that opens the door for all new kind of feedback. So you can actually talk about things way more deeply than you, than you would if you would just do straight up one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews or focus groups. So now we're getting closer to today. And you can look at Trump for a while while I take a sip of water. 
So 2016 was a really shitty year for a lot of us. Uh, first of all, because we got Trump. Um, but second of all, because that's the year when basically everybody died. Um, for me personally, um, it was a shitty year because there wasn't a single good um, launch or electro album released in that year. So um, I was very much into listening to Daft Punk's uh, Random Access Memories from 2013, which again is a great album and you should listen to it. Um, it was a significant year though because Pantone actually chose two colors, Rose Quartz and Serenity as, as their colors of the year. And I started working at Zalando. So, um, does this look familiar to anyone? I didn't expect. Oh, well, there might be one guy there. That's cool. So um, I was working on, I was actually working on a very specific part of Zalando. So there was, there was this um, mobile venture called Fleek, um, which was resided in Berlin. And we were working on concepts for social shopping. So instead of just generating um, a platform for selling more sneakers to millennials, uh, we were actually focusing on, on figuring out how can we generate a model where the influencers um, and the social media enthusiasts and the bloggers and vloggers and whoever could actually be vessels for selling outfits uh, to each other and, and to the millennials who we wanted to buy more sneakers. Um, so that, that gave birth to the concept of Fleek, and, and it was a really fun project to work on, again, for multiple reasons. Um, first of all, because I actually started, I started the design team. I was the sole designer for a really long time, um, cranking everything on my own. So I, I went from research to concepting to um, wireframing to these final mocks right here uh, on my own before I finally had, had the budget to hire a real design team. Uh, and it was, it was actually a really nice time because I, I, was a, I was a design team lead for, or had been a design team lead for quite some time before this. So I had to recalibrate how I think about being a designer and how I think about being a design leader. Um, we kind of started the design team um, randomly to fix an immediate need. The immediate need was that I was going crazy because I was alone working on all of this stuff and uh, I was getting really stressed out. So getting the, getting the money to hire designers kind of me got me into a mode where I just wanted to get somebody to help me. And I didn't really have time to think uh, who I'm hiring. I happened to make, make some really, 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 really great hires. Um, which, which was fortunate for me, but the whole process was kind of random and, and, and I was kind of running before walking. Um, interestingly, um, like I said, the hires I made were awesome and we built a really nice, strongly knitted um, design team. And I learned that, because like I said, I had to recalibrate what I thought design and design leadership is. I, I learned that design, being a design leader, regardless of whether you're actually managing a team or not, is mostly just generating engagement for the team. And I'm gonna get back to that in a moment. Um, from Zalando, I ended up working at Google. So um, how many of you recognize these two logos? Sweet. How many of you actually recognize the one on the right? Not that many. That's Jamboard. So um, back in 2017, they uh, headhunted me to Google uh, to work on so-called meeting solutions. So we were working on, on um, reimagining what the future of remote working looks like. So we were thinking about how do you take the technology that Google can provide and, and turn that into something that removes friction from remote workshops. Really, really awesome time. But it also strengthened my, um, strengthened my idea that true design leadership is fueling team engagement. And I like to... Um, visualize that usually with this picture. So what basically drives engagement is three things, right? So there's giving people autonomy, um, helping them with mastery of their skills and giving them a purpose. So as a design leads, regardless of whether you're doing that as a full-time job or not, you should be enabling autonomy, fostering mastery and driving for a purpose. But now that I've been rambling about the past, um, what about the future? So I promise to make sense in the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, 
the learnings I had from the early years and how I think that's relevant for the future. So one of the first things I keep talking about um, right now at work is actually this. So back in the day, um, we didn't actually consider marketing and design to be two separate things. Like we're working on, on web design, and when you, when you were working on web design in an ad agency back then, it actually meant that you were doing marketing and what we now call design at the same time. So I'm kind of starting to see that at some point, marketing and design will start to come closer together again. Because I already see the I already see the writing on the wall. There's, there's shared tools that we use, customer journey maps, customer life cycles. We're, we're basically using um, a lot of the service design tools to tie these things together. So I actually think, and you can freely challenge me with this, is that all CX-related fields might eventually fuse into a single discipline. I'm not sure if that happens, but I see that already happening. The other thing I think that's interesting is that instead of being T-shaped, um, designers would become skateboard-shaped. So basically, um, what that means is we're again starting to just be designers. So a lot of the skills that uh, we have in, in UX and in service design and business design, it's all starting to fuse together, which I think is a healthy thing. Um, but I also see that there is a need and there is a pot potential for artisanal deep expertise being respected even, even in the future. So there's a lot of people in this audience that I know uh, from their deep expertise that I really respect, and I know that that's something that will still continue to uh, be respected in the future. And this is probably one of my more, um, more trolley statements, but I think customers will eventually become the designers. And when I say that, um, what I mean is that transactions will become the engine for design. So regardless of whether that's going to be through actual AI and, and machine learning, automatically changing things based on customer transactions, I think the insights that we're generating from the data is already kind of um, making customer change their own journeys for themselves. And as a last thing, um, I think what's prominent, and, I, and I'm glad Elisa already brought this up, I think leadership, um, and design leadership in particular, is more and more going to be about the purpose of design. Um, it's not just us leading millennials who um, want to leave the world for a better place. I think we as designers have a responsibility to do that. And with that, in the, in the spirit of leaving the world for better, you should really, really subscribe to my playlist. <laughs> Peace out. <laughs>